Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akesh Rafi. Today is September 17, 2020, and I'm speaking with Mary Fissell, who is professor in the Department of the History of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University. Thank you for joining us, Mary. Thank you so much for having me. Mary, you've been working on the history of a popular medical book called Aristotle's Masterpiece. There are many copies of Aristotle's Masterpiece in the collections of the consortium's member institutions. Can you tell us about your experience looking at these copies? Sure. In 1684, in the tiny Somerset village of Dowlish Wake in the southwest of England, Elizabeth Vincent and George Hoare professed their love to one another. A year later, they wrote their promise on the flyleaf of a book, each vowing, I do wish that I may never prosper if I be the cause of breaking of it. They dated this exchange, December 12, 1685. The book they wrote in, Aristotle's Masterpiece, has been the focus of my research for years. It's not by Aristotle. It's a small book about sex and babies that became the best-selling book on the topic, all the way from 1684, when it was first published, up into the 20th century. Today, I want to share with you some of the pleasures of research, the moments in a rare book room or archive where I've held a copy of the book in my hand and pondered its individual history. This copy of the book, in which Vincent and Hoare pledged their love, is now in the Kislak Special Collections in the Van Pelt Library at the University of Pennsylvania. I'll get back to Vincent and Hoare in a moment, but a little more about Aristotle's masterpiece first. I was originally attracted to the work because it seemed to promise insight into how ordinary women understood their bodies in the past. After all, it went into hundreds of editions, so it must have been saying something that readers wanted. I've also long loved the history of the book, and so the project combined that passion with my history of medicine training and my experience in working on books intended for what I call vernacular audiences, that is, ordinary people, not medical professionals. By now, I have looked at hundreds of copies of this work, and I still get excited when I see one that's new to me. It's an unusual methodology for a historian of these kinds of books. Usually, scholars who search out lots of copies of books are working on the big guys. Owen Gingrich, for example, traced every extant copy of the first edition of Copernicus's De Revolutionibus. And recently, Daniel Margashi has written about copies of Vesalius's De Fabrica, arguing that what its original readers valued isn't exactly what we value. But looking at lots and lots of copies of Aristotle's masterpiece has begun to pay off. I'm forever grateful to all those librarians who have conserved and cataloged all those small, beat-up, well-thumbed copies I've been working on. When Elizabeth Vincent and George Hoare inscribed their promises into the book in 1685, it had been a tumultuous year. Perhaps writing their promises down made sense in a world that had been turned upside down. That summer, the Duke of Monmouth, the king's illegitimate son, had led a rebellion centered in Somerset, and it had been brutally put down. Soldiers had marched through villages five miles from Dowlish Wake, and many a Somerset man who had joined the rebellion was executed or transported to America. Eighteen months later, Hoare and Vincent made new promises to each other, again recorded in the fly leaves of Aristotle's masterpiece. This time their wording was more elaborate. I do wish that I may never prosper if I be the cause of breaking of it between you and me, and you wish that the pieces of silver may be a cloche to my conscience if I be the cause of breaking it. 1687, June the 29th day. I think that what's happening here is that George had given Elizabeth a gift of silver coins and said that it should serve as an alarm bell for her conscience should she break her promise to him. He stuck with the simpler, I wish that I may never prosper line for himself. These kinds of courtship gifts and the anxieties about staying true were completely characteristic of the era. 
Indeed, the figure of speech that George used about a bell for the conscience had been used in an earlier play about a failed courtship. The title, The Vow Breaker, pretty much tells you what you need to know. A young woman breaks off her engagement, her grief-stricken fiancé kills himself, and then his ghost haunts her until she drowns herself. Versions of this story circulated endlessly in broadside ballads, sung and sold in the street for a halfpenny. In many of these, the courtship gift plays a key role. In the 1680s, marriage didn't actually have to take place in church. A couple who exchanged vows and a gift might well be considered to be married, or at least very firmly committed, in their own eyes and in their communities. It's not until Lord Hardwick's Marriage Act in 1753 that English law specified requirements for a formal ceremony of marriage. So the gravity of George and Elizabeth's vows suggests that these were very serious commitments, tantamount to marriage itself. But why did they inscribe these vows inside a copy of Aristotle's masterpiece? In theory, it was a book for married women who needed to know about conception, pregnancy, childbirth, and care of the newborn. I'm also kind of impressed that this copy of the masterpiece, a brand new book, had made it all the way down to rural Somerset that quickly. But from the very beginning, the work was always something more than just a book for women. And it wasn't written in the usual sense of the term. It was assembled from bits of earlier works. One of the sources was a standard midwifery guide from which the compiler took chapters on the signs of conception, the development of the fetus, choosing a good midwife, breastfeeding, etc., etc. Other sources included a book on natural philosophy and a selection from the works of Ambroise Paré, the 16th century French surgeon. The unknown compiler used the oldest marketing technique of all, sex. Right on the title page, it baldly announces that the book includes a word of advice to both sexes in the act of copulation. Wow, that's really hot stuff for the 1680s. At the very end of the book, the compiler included two pages taken from Paré that describe what we'd call foreplay. It advised that women took a while to warm up, so a man should cherish, embrace, and tickle her use wanton kisses, and handle her secret parts and dugs, that's their word for the breast. This is by far the most erotically specific two pages in any popular medical work of the time, and I suspect it was key to the book's runaway success. However, this riot of sexual stuff was for married people. The Paré passages call the man and the woman husband and wife and frame good sex within the imperative of getting pregnant. He shouldn't withdraw too soon, for example, because cold might strike the womb and destroy the two seeds before they do what they are supposed to do, which is intermingle to form a new being. So while Elizabeth Vincent and George Hoare were pledging their love, they weren't the intended readership for this book, at least not yet. This was knowledge that was very specifically meant for married couples. Once I started thinking about Hor and Vincent, I realized how many other examples I had of young people reading the book. The most well-known case happened in Northampton, Massachusetts. In 1746, Minister Jonathan Edwards was horrified to discover that his younger parishioners had been reading the masterpiece for years, and some of the young men had been harassing women with the knowledge they gained from it. For example, in Rebecca Strong's shop, a pack of four young men assured her that they knew more about her body than she did. We know as much about you as you and more, one of them leered. They credited the masterpiece as the source of their knowledge, jokingly referring to it as a young folk's Bible. This usage must have stung Edwards, for that very same group had done an intensive Bible study group with him years before, when they were just 12 or 13. Now they were studying a very different text. None of these young men ever went on to marry in Northampton. They were all either younger sons or from families who had no land to give them. They were, in effect, shut out of the local marriage market. I see this kind of sexual aggression as a kind of acting out, pushing against the fact they were unlikely to ever be doing 
what was actually described in the masterpiece. In Northampton, most people were clear this wasn't the sort of knowledge young unmarried folks were supposed to have. The masterpiece was referred to as a granny book, gendering it clearly, and perhaps referring to the use of granny as a term for midwife. One of the young men, Noah Baker, had concealed the book in his coat, hidden underneath the lining. Later, his sister Sarah found it there and swiftly gave it to her mother. The implication is that perhaps the book was hers. Another copy in the village belonged to a younger married couple who loaned it to a brother who was courting. Other young unmarried people continued to read the book. For example, in the library company in Philadelphia, there's a copy in which a teenaged Benedict Booker wrote his name. He later scratched out some of what he had written. He grew up to be a highly respected physician. In a British library copy, it looks as if young people were practicing writing their names. On page 5, Ruth Swindell declared it was her book, twice, with another four inscriptions from her sprinkled through the book. Not to be outdone, Hannah Marple, Sarah Webster, and James Swindell inscribed their names multiple times as well. The evidence of inscriptions such as these suggests that the book was popular with both men and women, and was read not only by the intended readership of married couples, but by younger people as well. Women often emphasized their ownership by making it clear that this was their book. A copy at Hopkins asserts Elizabeth Wright, her book, 1704. Sarah, whose last name I can't quite read, did the same in a copy now held by the College of Physicians in Philadelphia. If we return to that first edition in which Elizabeth Vincent and George Hoare pledged themselves, and we turn to the back flyleaf, we meet another woman. Over a century later, Sarah Fackrell noted she had been given the book in 1810 by her aunt Case in the small Somerset village of Curry Rivel. It's about ten miles from where Vincent and Hoare had lived. I can't quite trace its passage through family lines across the county of Somerset, but I think there must be family ties between Hoare and Vincent and Sarah Fackrell. She used the fly leaves to record the births of her children in detail. William Fackrell, the son of the said Sarah Fackrell, was born on Friday, the 19th of April, at 8 o'clock at night, 1805. Sadly, the birth of another William was recorded the following year. Also, William was born March the 5th at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 1806, meaning that the first William had died before his first birthday. Fackrell recorded the births of three further children, John, Anne, and Charlotte. Fackrell's inscriptions seem to speak to us of her lived experience. No mention is made of the baby's father. She says, the son of the said Sarah Fackrell. But the time of day they were born, five o'clock in the afternoon or eight o'clock at night, is noted for every birth, a fact that held meaning for the woman who had been in labor for hours beforehand. She probably recorded most of these births years after the fact. If Aunt Case had given her the book in 1810, all the children save the last, Charlotte, had already been born. Perhaps the book had already been on loan to her for years. The name Aunt Case suggests an unmarried sister of her mother's or a sister-in-law. Sarah's own maiden name had been Hawkins. Sarah Fackrell's use of a book about making babies to record the births of her children seems to have an internal logic of its own. The inscriptions match the intended purposes of the book. From a larger perspective, of course, Fackrell was using the text as many families used their copy of the Bible. Here, the Northampton youth's joking reference to the masterpiece as a Bible has taken on meaning without irony. The book truly was a substitute for the Bible. And the Fackrell family was far from unique. In a 1721 edition from the Charles Rosenberg collection donated to the library company, Jacob and Mary Fry recorded the births of Mary, Rachel, and Catherine in the late 1760s and 1770s. Writing down names and birth dates tightened the bonds of kinship and wove the names of those who died as babies into the fabric of the family, ensuring that their brief lives were not forgotten. Perhaps I am stretching too far, but the women who inscribed birth names and dates into books were doing what we have come to call emotional work, or perhaps what we might better call the work of kinship. The use of the masterpiece as an equivalent to the Bible 
was so common that Edward Wyatt was able to use his family's copy in court. In 1832, Wyatt, aged 77, tried to claim a pension for his service back during the Revolution. He had lost his discharge papers over the intervening decades. Two other men testified that yes, he had indeed served. All three signed their testimony with an X, implying limited literacy. But the clincher seems to have been a copy of the masterpiece that Wyatt produced in court. It testified to Wyatt's age since it had recorded his birth. He got the pension and lived to the ripe old age of 88. So by looking at many, many copies of the masterpiece, I've begun to see how readers actually interacted with the book. And I've also found some unexpected readers. Thinking about Vincent and Hoare and those obnoxious young men in Northampton and a host of other younger readers helped me to see that the book was providing a kind of sex ed long before any such subject was taught in schools. At the same time as a material object, the book could serve as an embodiment of family and kinship, recording women's joys and sorrows in the birth of their children. I'd like to close on a happy note. Like you, probably, I wondered what happened to Elizabeth Vincent and George Hoare. Happily, the relevant parish registers have been digitized, and I can tell you that at long last, six years after that inscription recording the gift of silver, almost a decade after their first promise, they got married on Boxing Day, 1693. Ten months later, Elizabeth gave birth to their son, William. Thanks for listening. That's terrific. Thank you, Mary, for sharing your work and your perspectives on this fascinating book. Thank you. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for the History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. You can find more resources for exploring this topic, other podcasts, video lectures, archival spotlights, as well as opportunities to connect with our community of scholars at chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Rita Allen Foundation.